they pull the brake shoes, which are cast iron pieces, against the wheels to stop. Well, at some point during its life over in here, I don't think it was at Sanford, the air compressor, which controls the amount of air that's uh, pressured in the uh, air cylinders, didn't stop when it reached the height of the pressure that it was supposed to get. And they overpressured and broke where you can see the ends of the beams. Now, part of that also is because they were worn. There are bushings in here, but they had worn and they had kind of rubbed through. One of them literally snapped right off. So you see four new ones that we're going to make. They've started making the holes. They have to drill them out just the right size, and they'll press a new hardened bushing in here, which is the way they were done originally. Uh, so little, on some of these, you, you will see that the holes have worn quite badly with the pressure uh, that they're exerting. Uh, so we're going to put bushings in all of them. And they will then be cut also to shape. You see how they've tapered at the end. So they'll be tapered in that way to give it a bit more artistic uh, look. Uh, I don't think it really makes any difference in the function of it, but it looks a little bit better. So that's in progress. There's a hardened bushing right here, which uh, a pin like this would go through. And sometimes the pins are hard and sometimes they're not. You can see that this one has worn pretty badly. We've had a, having a discussion as to whether to build that up or to make a new one. And uh, my machinist, may, uh, he's told me this isn't worth saving, but I think it is. So we'll see how we come out. The brakes are adjusted with uh, turnbuckles. This is the end of a turnbuckle. This one had also broken right off. The two sides are supposed to be the same. So what our machinist has done is he welded on a new piece of steel. This just happened to be the size of the steel, so that's why it's so long. He will then cut it right around like that so that it looks the same as this, and then with the milling machine, smooth it off, and then put hardened bushings in here also like that. They're supposed to press in, by the way. Otherwise, they'll fall out. Uh, this, and if they don't, uh, it's not something they did originally, but what we do is occasionally just touch a little bit of weld there to hold them in place. This one may or may not press in uh, properly. They're made just a little bit oversized, and then uh, with a hydraulic press, they push them in. All right, I think that's all here. These are small parts that are from the brake slack adjusters on ASL 100. We're probably going to more detail than anybody else ever did in this, but where these are subject to moisture, condensation, and so forth, we uh, paint every surface that we possibly can with a polyurethane paint that is very, very durable. Now we will shortly assemble the turnbuckles here. These are not too different from what you have on the old disc brakes in a car where you can adjust them so that it pushes the shoes tighter on the wheels. And these were bent because of overpressurization, very rusty, all jammed up, had to be heated red hot so that this would unscrew from the thread. There's a left and a right handed thread. You can see they go in opposite directions so that when you just turn this it will either push both out or push both in. And these are all ready to go, Just uh, they were just painted yesterday. One of the things we try to do, I don't know whether I mentioned it before or not, but uh, we try to use the original fasteners if we can. These are lag screws, which was what fastened a lot of the underbody equipment together in 100. Nowadays they're hex head, but what these are are obviously square head and a little difficult to buy so we saved the old ones, sandblasted them, and then they will be replaced, uh, not replaced, they will be replaced in 100. Okay. And here's a few more. This is kind of an interesting piece. Uh, this was hand forged, hammered out uh, in uh, the Laconia Car Company's blacksmith shop. They took a flat piece of metal and bent that over and then they forge welded this 
piece right on here. I'm not sure just how they did it, but chances are there's a it was laid out uh, kind of a little diagonal right here and hammered this thing red hot so that they're right together. What this does, if you have a block of or a long piece that you want to fasten down to uh, something, you put it here, put a lag screw through here, the wood is here, and then this bolts down to another piece. So we'll heat that nut red hot and get it off. This one over here is suffering a little bit and we will probably end up uh, replacing that part of it, though we can certainly keep this. But look at all the, what the corrosion had done to that. I don't know exactly where this came from, uh, but uh, it'll certainly be strong enough even though it's pretty well eaten out and back. Okay. even the small lag screws right here. These are pins that go in the various uh, brake rigging pieces. That one will straighten. We may get some new rivets like like this. Uh, these were not hardened so they wore and then they corroded badly also. It's a judgment call. We obviously want this to be safe but on the other hand we don't want it to be brand new. There's a grab rail that goes on top of the one of the end hooks. Okay. is a thing called a pilot, or most people call it cow catchers, though they didn't catch pilots, uh, didn't catch cows, uh, they just basically kept anything away that would be in front. And they're made of oak, and what we did, we had only a very few pieces, but we have pictures and just enough so we knew what there was to make it out of. So this is kind of the kit of the oak, which we will next summer have a gentleman who's a very good cabinet maker will make the two, one for each end of the car. Underneath it is some leftover southern yellow pine. The barnstormers gave us a few extra pieces, which is nice because we have had to use them. And then the original sills are this pile of material right here. We're saving them just a little bit longer in case there's some information on them that we might need, though we're pretty close to um, being through with them. And we'll send them out. If anybody wants some souvenirs, why, there they are. We have plenty. These are the teeth of the pilot, these shorter pieces right here. We have long teeth and short teeth, and then there are various other parts of the actual frame. This is oak, which was red oak, which was the flooring in a factory in New Jersey. And uh, I think it was quite a bit thicker, so they plowed, uh, planed it down to size. And uh, all we have to do is uh, bevel the corners and then fix the, the ends. All we have to do, it's going to take a lot of figuring because there's lots of compound angles in it. That'll be fun for our friend Tom Dow to do. Right. This is the first of the two trucks for 100 and it's largely going together. Uh, we've All the pieces have either been remade or rebuilt. I'm going to start from the end here and work up to the center of the truck and then it's the same on the other end. This is the frame, which is a piece of heavy iron that's bent into a large rectangle, and that's what ties everything together. On the end of the frame are a couple of rollers, and there's a beam that road rides on them where the brakes pull in, so this is toward the center of the of locomotive. Right in here will go the wheels and axles, and then in here will go the motor, which one of the end of which sits on the axle. This is a motor mount, which is a casting that has a bar that sits in it. We had to make new ones because the old ones were just completely rotted away. This is a brake shoe head, where the steel brake shoe sits, and a brake beam, which we had to rebuild because it was all badly worn out. Uh, in here, you can't see them anymore, but the leaf springs, one here, one on the other side, have to be compressed. So this, is, this pin is just there for stability. But, so that these pins can be pressed, pushed across here, and hold the leaf spring down. And then when there's weight on the locomotive, when it goes on the rough track, it can kind of bounce up and down. We're fairly close to getting this together. We just have to devise some way of, of maybe a channel iron across with a threaded rod vertically on each side so we can squeeze it down, push the pin through, and then you can let them off, and nothing will happen. 
the other end's exactly the same. Right, so this center thing is called the bolster, and it bounces up and down slightly. Uh, if you look over through there, you can also see springs. Uh, that's part of what's called an equalizer. There's springs on each corner of the truck, and uh, that allows the truck to go over uneven track, and the wheels stay on it rather than uh, if it's more rigid. Uh, if the track is uneven enough, you might have a wheel not even touching the rail. Up here is the other truck. It has been our pattern up until now, but we have pretty well done all the work on it, and uh, we probably can start taking it apart now. Oh, here are the motor mounts. Uh, the motor, uh, the bar is in here, and it bounces up and down, so these are very badly worn. They had to build this center area up here. Back to the original specification, the bottom had uh, broken off, so they've welded some new steel there. And it's a square bolt that went in here that held it, and they had to make a square down on the bottom, which uh, was kind of a challenge for the machinist, but they did it. So those, these are the ones for this truck. They're already on, on the other truck. You might get a better view of that from this end. Yeah. The uh, pair of springs are, to the, when the motor starts, it is, uh, mounts, they call it the wheelbarrow mounting. The, what would be equivalent to the wheel of a wheelbarrow would be where the axle is in the front, and then the, what would be like the handles on the wheelbarrow would be where the springs are, and that bar that I said goes across <laughs> between the two springs. And when the motor starts, it tries to flip up or flip down, so the springs cushion that, and keep it from rotating all the way around, which wouldn't be very desirable. We also looked at brake uh, levers that are being rebuilt, and they will go down inside of here. And there, there's a whole lever mechanism, which is more obvious on the other truck, that, that allows the brake shoes to push against the wheel or not. And when, well, I don't know if you want to show this or whatever you have already. Because it does, all the levers are here and you can sort of see them. The pull comes from here, except it's broken off because it just was worn out so badly. This pulls on here, which then pulls on the levers here. Like that. And you can almost see it move. Maybe I can do it on the other side. Anyway, when you pull on it, you can see the, the brake shoe down there. You know what? Maybe you were, if you were over here, I could do it better. All right. When the brakes are pulled on, put on by the air pressure, there's a piston that moves a lever, which moves another lever, which moves another lever, and it eventually pulls on this rod, which pushes this wheel out here. Now, as I'm pushing, pulling here, the bottom of that is going the other direction, so it pushes against the wheels on the other side. And there's a big turnbuckle between the two, which adjusts the difference between them, and that's what pushes the, the wheel up against it, or the, the brake shoe against the wheel. As you can see, there's a little bit that has to be done. We have made these pieces. We've made the piece that goes across the bottom, and then the rest of the stuff is going to have to be taken out and evaluate it one piece at a time. I think that's it. Okay. This is called a journal bearing. Imagine under here is a shaft, which is really the axle of the wheel, and it turns around inside of that. To, because they wear unevenly, they put a soft material called Babbitt, which is basically lead and tin, uh, inside of it. We had these lined, uh, lined or the ballot was poured by a place way out in, um, no, it was actually poured by a place in Massachusetts, that's right. And they got it as close as they could, but the axles are worn somewhat unevenly. So first thing we did was have them machined in an outfit down in Machias, Maine, roughly to the dimension that we need. Then our machinist will take this put some blue dye on here 
set it on the axle, move it back and forth, and where the blue die rubs away, he knows that's too high and he'll scrape it and gradually scrape it back, uh, back and forth time and time again until it fits perfectly on the axle. So these are all ready to go, but the, at this time of year, the axles are buried in snow. Fortunately, they're rust proof, but uh, he will get to that when it gets warmer. Interesting, B&M, three and three quarter. Three and three quarters is the size of the axle, and these are Boston and Maine. Uh, they bought for the Boston and Maine. I guess the York Utilities must have bought them from them. This is the side sill for ASL 100. They're numbered from one, by our numbering, we're numbering them from one to eight. One and eight are the outside ones, and the other seven, six are on the inside. This is southern yellow pine, 100 years old before it even uh, started out life in the mill in uh, the Bates Mill in Lewiston. And then it came here, and we have put it sitting on the bolsters and put it up in place, which defined this side. And this is virtually done. There are some uh, rivets along the side which are holding another piece to the inside, a cab support piece, which we can see later on. On the other side is another one that looks exactly the same way, uh, which was put on. The ends had to be shaped especially with uh, tenons that then fitted into here. This whole thing is just a great big wooden frame which is held together by mortises and tenons. This is the end frame, which is actually tenoned to all of the longitudinal sills numbers, well, number one through eight. Then under here is what I call the pilot support beam, the pilot being the cow catcher in what some people have say, and it's bolted to this. And then under here is what I call the coupler support beam, and this hole is for an air pipe to come through. These are all bolted together by long bolts that we made here in the shop, following the pattern that was on the other. The coupler is spaced out on these blocks because the pilot is way out here uh, to keep things out from under the car, so that's why these, these are here. This is the mount for the coupler, the knuckle coupler, which would then fasten on to whatever cars they were pulling with this. We have that out because it's in the way and it's just awfully heavy to get put it up yet. Interestingly enough, the way this locomotive is held together is these two truss rods, what I call them, are just rods of some kind, and they go all the way through 30 feet or more to the other end of the locomotive and come out the other end with nuts on them and another casting just exactly like this. Well, one of the challenges we had was to get the beam, the end sill, to fit over the tenons. It was very uh, stiff. The tenons were just exactly right and maybe not lining up quite right. So what we did is we put the other end together like this and then up here we put blocks on and we forced by tightening up, tightening up on these screws we forced this in. It didn't take any hammering or anything else and it just slipped in quite nicely. We were wondering if it would make it but it has it pulled up very well. We also had to level up everything so now you can see this is the deck of the, is, uh, of the locomotive is ready for decking, but the reason we haven't put anything in there is because we need to work underneath and we need to have light, we need to have a little access to reach down for the wires and the piping and so forth. So this is now all together. The entire frame of the locomotive is together and we're now working underneath. The entire side of this locomotive is, what is a truss rod, which starts at the end on the polling pocket, which we haven't talked about either yet. The polling pocket has a big nut on the end of it, and then the rod comes across at this level, goes down, you can just barely see it, goes under a saddle here, goes at this level to another item called needle beam, goes back up and out through the other end. This is meant to help hold the center of the locomotive up. In my opinion, it was overkill because 
these beams are plenty strong and they were just as straight the day we took them out, which was a surprise considering how deteriorated they were as they were when they were built by Laconia. Uh, on this side and all the locations except for one, they have this little saddle which was made of a piece of channel iron and it's obviously latter day because it was cut with a torch. And uh, we don't know what happened to the original ones. When we look at the other side, we'll see they had a cast iron uh, casting that fit a lot better than this did. But this is the way they ended up. And they have a wood spacer block here so that this is pushing up. Now, this is an air brake locomotive. That is, the brakes are operated by air. And in order to store the air, you have to have air tanks. This one has three tanks. This is what's called an auxiliary reservoir. Uh, which is a small one, and then there's a main reservoir down here. Because of deterioration, uh, let me back up a little bit. Every air tank that goes on any vehicle we have here, we give what's called a hydro test. We pressurize water in them. If you pressurize air and anything let go, it would expand explosively and it would be dangerous. With water, which doesn't compress, the only compression is the slight stretching of the air tank. And we found two of the three original air tanks were bad. They had holes in them. Uh, one of them we didn't have to pressurize. Uh, we just saw the holes. Uh, fortunately, one of the originals we were able to save. It was pressurized at one and a half times its operating pressure. So it was pressurized about 200 pounds. This is an air tank that we found in stock. It was made in 1999 and originally had uh, feet on the end, so they bolted it up. But we ground those feet off and used the original straps here, so you really can't tell. It looks virtually the same as an original tank. On the other side, we'll see another one that came from a what's called a Philadelphia bridge car. It was a subway car. It's a little longer than the original, but it's the same diameter. And that was the critical thing. We'll talk about that when we get over to that side. Uh, on top of each one of these tanks, you'll see a block. Uh, which I just call a reservoir mounting. And because these were out to the edge of the car, when the water ran down, the ends of these just utterly disintegrated. So we made new ones out of old oak that was left over from some that we got for the, uh, the decking and uh, fitted them on here. And then they're bolted down with a bolt on each end of these straps go around the whole time. So there's two here and two down here. One original was good enough to use but everything was cracked, even the new old wood. So we had to uh, use a lot of epoxy filler, and right now they're as good as new. This block holds the air brake cylinder, and it's kind of neat because it's a big piece of wood, a little hard to get. It was cracked and broken, but by pulling it together and putting epoxy on it, I've got it now in one piece, and it's as solid as ever holding up the brake cylinder, which is in the middle. This is the brake cylinder, which is really what makes the brakes work. It's 10 inches in diameter. Oh, just a minute. Oops. Sorry. Start start to, yeah, I'll have to start okay. off. This is the brake cylinder, which makes the brakes work. It's 10 inches in diameter and has a stroke of about 12 inches. That is, there's a piston inside that will push out 12 inches, and then it goes through all the various levers until it finally gets to all of the eight wheels. This is May, it says GE on the side, but I have a feeling this was made in Watertown, New York by the uh, New York Air Brake Company. We'll see another component in a minute that is uh, definitely made by them. We took this apart, took both ends of it off, cleaned it out. It had a leather piston cup in it. Uh, the technicians thought that we should replace it. I, it really wasn't that bad, but because we had it apart, we put a new modern neoprene cup in there and then it, it was tested, it leaks ever so slightly, so it will, be, it will be just fine. We're in the process of putting the piping in the car. Uh, we're replacing every piece because a good deal of it is very badly corroded. You can see the rust on here. It's a wonder it held any air at all. Uh, some of that may have taken place here with our condensation. So basically what we've done is we bought all new fittings, whole box of them, about $214 worth of them there, and new pipe, and we're replacing it one piece at a time so that everything's going back 
pretty near the way it was. And we say pretty near because it's never possible to get it exactly the same. But uh, so far we've plumbed in this area. Our air brake. Uh, All right. What I have my hand beside is a triple valve, a very old style. It's called a style E and uh, part PT84, whatever that means. But right here it says NY in the logo of the New York Air Brake Company of Watertown, New York. They're still in business here 100 years later. And uh, in here is a brass valve that goes up and down and it controls the air on the entire train line. Uh, each car in a train will have what they call an auxiliary reservoir like this and it's from this reservoir that the air actually goes directly to the brakes and this triple valve and I'm not up on it enough to know all the functions but basically what this does is it allows the air to go not just into this locomotive but to any cars they're all hooked together through that. All the piping on it, as we said, is not very good. The levers, uh, this end had broken off the brake cylinder. They fixed that. The, the uh, levers were all taken off. I was just about to do this last night when I ran out of time. This is what's called the dead lever. It goes right in here. And that has a pivot right here and uh, it will pull on the brakes on the truck which is out there. There's another one behind me called the live lever which will do the same thing on the other end. What we're doing is putting together the materials that are or the components underneath the car in a specific order. The things that are the hardest to move and the most rigid as far as where they're going to be we put on first, the brake cylinder, the reservoirs. The next thing is a little bit more uh, flexible, and that's the brake levers here. The slide on this this thing right here. The piping is there's some flexibility in, and then the last thing we will do is the motor wiring, and then we can put the deck on. Uh, we're able to work just barely around here, and you can see there's a mess of all the old pipes here, which uh, in the next couple of days we're going to replace one piece at a time, and uh, then it'll be all open in here. We did raise the car up about another foot so that we could get around on, under here. Uh, there are various things under here that are also important. That's a bracket for the shaft of the handbrake. That, there's a wheel up inside the cab with a shaft that extends down and rests on that bracket there. And then it has a chain wrapped around it which goes around a pulley over there and then goes to the, that, the chain ends up on this right here. This is called a sway bar, at least they call it that in England and I've adapted that term. And that actually is what pulls the handbrakes on. Uh, that, that's connected through various chains and levers to, to the other brakes. And uh, all these things were, uh, were taken down, they were badly corroded, and now they've all been painted just like new. It was kind of an interesting uh, arrangement here for the handbrake, and we're not quite sure what they had in mind, but these two blocks of wood are original, going back to 1906, and there were holes in them, but they were never used. And this bracket uh, was fastened about two inches over through bolts that went here through another block. So we moved it back to where it was originally, uh, because it's much more solid. I had no idea why they did it that way, uh, though the original uh, mounting looked pretty solid, whereas this doesn't. And so uh, we'll see what happens. If they don't work, then we can move it over a little bit using the old pieces of wood replaced. Uh, now, the other reservoir, there are two main reservoirs because uh, when you have uh, a train, you need to have a lot of air capacity. This, we have pictures of this hauling four or five cars, and each one of them would have a small reservoir, but ultimately it has to get its air from that. Uh, the, as I said earlier, the, that reservoir had a hole in it, was not suitable. We looked around our museum grounds and we found we had a lot of air reservoirs, too big and too small. Well, this one was the right diameter, so it would fit in that area where it was originally. Uh, but it's longer, 
Now we had room because beyond the end of that are, is where the original air compressor hung. At some point, and probably fairly early in the locomotive's life, sometime after 1920, uh, they put the air compressor up in one of the hoods. And so this is, uh, there was a space here that was used for nothing. So we were able to put a reservoir on that was about a foot longer than the original, and we had room to do it. Some people had said, well, why don't you uh, get new ones made? But uh, number one, the new ones would not look like the old ones, and number two, they would be quite expensive, and these are just fine. And if anybody years from now wants to get a new one made, they can do it. But meanwhile, it will be done. Talk about the wiring is the last thing to be done. It's, it's somewhat flexible anyway. There are bundles made up of uh, fire hose and friction tape, which contain eight or a dozen wires and they go from one end of the locomotive to the other. Uh, and we will, as a last thing underneath here, we will actually construct the holes, probably put them up on the deck and uh, do it from there. Uh, and then fasten them down in between the, um, the sills like they were originally. And then we can finally put the deck on. We're close. I'm wondering about this color that you see on a lot of the wood. Uh, that is an imitation. It's Cabot's barn oil-based barn red stain, which is an imitation of a uh, stain that they used on all of the wood when the car was constructed. And you can see remains of it here and there. There's quite a bit of it showing on the center sills, which were well protected. Uh, I don't know how effective it was, but this is 100 years old. and. Uh, it's, we're, we're scraping off what we can, and we'll, wherever we can get at it, we'll put new on, or it's pretty awkward getting up inside there. Uh, what else do I want to say? The inch and a quarter black rod that you see is the truss rod, and you can see how it angles up toward the front of the car and goes eventually over the bolster. Well, at this point, closer, it's going over the needle beam or under the needle beam, and it's going through the original casting, the only one of the castings that was left. And uh, that has a slight rounded area so it fits over the truss rod quite nicely. And then there's a pin cast into it on the top. So we drilled a hole there and pushed it up in. And then we tightened up the big bolts on either end and pulled the truss rods up so that they hold everything quite nicely. One of our difficulties was to try to work around those truss rods with uh, getting air tanks and the blocks and so forth in there, but as you can see, we did figure it out. Things go together almost the way they did originally, but always with a little bit of a challenge, which is what makes the job more interesting. Leaning against the wall, we have new old red oak flooring, tongue and groove. There's the tongue. There's the groove made for us by Barnstormers in Portland, which is, this is one of their large uh, things that they do or, or more than anything else, is recycle old wood and make it into flooring. And uh, what it's doing is it's going to replace the poorer or missing parts like this. This is the original floor. I'm not quite sure why we kept this one. It's slightly deteriorated, as you can see. It may have been just a pattern. It's coming in two widths. This is five and a quarter and the other is ten inches wide. And just like in the original, they used various widths uh, to take advantage of the materials that they had. Uh, these were fastened down to the deck with uh, long nails, about three, three and a half inch nails. Uh, we're probably going to do the same thing, except we'll probably use a stainless steel nail, which I haven't uh, really investigated yet. So this will go down after we get through with everything else uh, underneath the car. We need the light and the space to work. I was just talking to someone the other day and he said, well, they used to normally would build things upside down and they put, chances are that this was built upside down and then they flipped the deck over. We don't have that luxury of being able to do that, though with Christ they do. Oh, and we didn't talk about what these are. All right. Can I? Yep. Yeah. All right. This is the end of the truss rod, big square nut. In order to tighten that, we needed about a four-foot wrench and 
pushing as hard as we could. This is a non-standard nut. Uh, it's it's almost inch and a quarter or whatever the, the threads per inch is, but not quite. And we had some trouble getting them on. But with a big enough wrench, we were able to pull up and tighten them up. This is a beautiful casting made by Laconia, uh, cast steel probably. But this is something that uh, most people wonder what they are. You will find them on the corner of older locomotives, corners, and on the corner of older freight cars. It's called a polling pocket, and it's for a rather scary sounding practice that they used to use. They would have a pole, a wooden pole, about eight or ten feet long, with the ends, uh, with a band of steel around them to keep them from splitting. And it would be about this big on the end. They would put it in here, and then on the adjacent track there was a car they might want to move, and because of the arrangement of the track they couldn't get at it with a locomotive. So with this polling pocket and pole between them, they would push that car along. When they got to where they want to go, they put the brakes on and the locomotive, the car would keep rolling and the pole would fall out on the ground. It's the putting it in that uh, we wonder about how safe that was, that somebody had to hold it there and the locomotive had to come up and push it in. I can see all kinds of problems. So we don't plan to use it, though we will have one on display on the locomotive. And uh, actually what it's going to be is one that was used, in, that Danny Cohen has, that they used to use them on the snow plows in Boston when cars were in the way. And Danny said the best place that they used to put the pole was right in the center of the trunk, so they would move the car. <laughs> that got the message out pretty quick that you don't park it in the snow storm. There are 10 cab sash in the cab of 100, nine of which are made of cherry and are very likely originals. One of which was a total replacement and is made out of white oak. And I have a feeling that that white oak was probably a, a piece of dunnage or something that they found. This was made by someone that did have good equipment because these holes are mortises, were made with a hollow chisel mortising machine just like we have, not hammered out or chiseled out by anybody's uh, primitive means. What it doesn't have as most sash have, is a cope right here that would fit around this uh, bead on the edge. They, instead, they, uh, they did it this way, which is uh, kind of a homemade sort of thing. But what, we, what happened, as you can see, is it warped for whatever reason. And I don't know whether it warped before or after we got the car, but to get glass to fit around that was difficult. So we're making new ones. We're using ash rather than oak because that's what we have. Uh, and we're in the process of carving it out right now. These are the two sizes of cab silt. There are three across each end that are narrow like this. It's cab windows. Stop. These are the, here are the two different sizes of cab windows for ASL 100. There are three across each end of the narrow type like this, and on the sides are two each of the larger ones. These were in salvageable but rather deteriorated condition. Over the winter, what we've done with these, rather than making new ones, we wanted to of course preserve the original. The corners, especially at the bottom, and the bottom rails were badly deteriorated. So there's a lot of epoxy that's been put in here to solidify these corners. And when they're all done, because they're painted, uh, you won't see them. But uh, we have uh, brought them back so they're quite solid. I'm looking at this one, and I hope we're not going to have a problem with the glass, because you can notice how warped it is. Um, one of the things we experimented with this on this, I think it's going to work, is we use Minwax wood hardener, which is a transparent material that saturates the uh, whatever you uh, are put it on, especially the ends where the water has tended to wick up into the ends of the wood and on the bottom of the sill. So that's been very carefully saturated. And then we put a gray epoxy primer on it. The next thing will be that the glass will go in and then they'll be painted with uh, a barn red or a tile red uh, All of the moldings are over here. 
the moldings are different for every window. They uh, obviously had a lot of problems over the years. So we have examples of broken glass that was found here and there. So we've had to use a combination of old and new uh, moldings here, and uh, that's the way they were. So the car was not, we're not making it brand new, we're just uh, showing how they would have done it if they had continued on. And that, I think, is everything. We've been doing all kinds of sandblasting of parts, and we're getting near the end, finally, of small components. Uh, these are mufflers, because when the air is released from a brake cylinder, it comes out with quite a blast. So I guess because uh, the locomotive worked within the town in Sanford, they objected to the noise they made, so they put uh, mufflers on to keep that sound down. We'll, I don't know just what's inside of here. We may take it apart to, to see uh, and then clean it all up. I'm, I'm sure they never painted it. It's mostly oil that, that's protected it. Uh, because they had to uh, push some cars up a uh, hill in Sanford, um, over, going over, over towards Springdale, they had to go up a hill, and then down in the mills there were some hills. They had to have sanders. And under the corner of the locomotive was a hopper full of sand. Here is, they would blow air in. The sand would fall down into a little pocket here, but there's a, a, a little barrier right here. So when they put air in here, it would blow that sand up over and down and would drop onto the rail, giving traction for the motor, which it wouldn't have otherwise. This one, someone has done some work on. This one is ready for sandblasting and so forth. And this is the, the air intake for the air compressor. It's a filter. I don't know how effective it was. But, uh, you can see it's led a hard life. It's been brazed on here. We found quite a few things that were kind of roughly brazed together uh, to keep the thing going yet another year or week or however long that they had. And so we'll clean that all up and paint it with the black. But we're, as far as the small components, why we're getting very near the end of all this. It's taken lots and lots of happy hours standing at the sandblaster, willing and maybe not so willing volunteers. But thank goodness it's. Uh, it's pretty well done now. Yeah.